In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. Please be seated. I now invite the Archbishop Emeritus of the Church in Washington, His Eminence Donald Cardinal Well, to greet the assembly on this auspicious occasion. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is a great pleasure for me on behalf of the Archdiocese of Washington to welcome all of you to this Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception as we joyfully gather for the installation of Archbishop Wilton Gregory as the seventh Archbishop of Washington. And to begin, I welcome the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States, Archbishop Christophe Pierre. The The presence of the personal representative of our Holy Father highlights the strong spiritual ties of this archdiocese with the Vicar of Christ and provides an opportunity to express our profound gratitude to Pope Francis, who as a sign of his great pastoral love has sent us Archbishop Gregory. <clears throat> it is indeed a pleasure to greet their eminences, Cardinal Edwin O'Brien, Cardinal Joseph Tobin, Cardinal Blaise Subich, Cardinal Sean O'Malley, Cardinal Alberto Suarezinda, Cardinal Justin Regali, and Cardinal Mahoney. You honor us by your presence here today. A warm welcome to my brother priests, to all of the bishops who are here in such large number, revered guests and members of faith communities that have a special bond to this archdiocese, distinguished representatives of federal, state, and local government, as well as members of the education, healthcare, and social service communities. I welcome as well our deacons, women and men in consecrated life, and in a very special way, those guests who have come today from the Archdiocese of Atlanta, the Diocese of Belleville, and the Archdiocese of Chicago. A, sp <laughs> A very special welcome to the family of Archbishop Gregory, and particularly his sisters, Claudia and Elaine. It's wonderful to have you here. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, friends all, welcome. This is a day that we have looked forward to with great and eager anticipation as our archdiocese assumes now the great joy of receiving our new archbishop and this Church of Washington rejoices. Here, here our new spiritual leader will find a church whose history includes the beginnings in Southern Maryland of the Catholic Church in the English-speaking New World. Here is also a faith community of great cultural and ethnic diversity, which is enriched each month by new members, especially from Central and South America, Asia, and Africa. Archbishop Wilton Gregory comes to this archdiocese after many years of Episcopal experience, beginning as Auxiliary Bishop in Chicago, Bishop of Belleville, and most recently as Archbishop in Atlanta. In your program, you will find much fuller biographical material on our new Archbishop, but allow me simply to note that all of us here recognize his many gifts and welcome him as a faith filled pastor.
It is clear that Pope Francis sends us a bishop attuned to the signs of the times and endowed with great pastoral ability. Once again, personally and in the name of the faithful of this archdiocese, I welcome all of you. We look forward not only to the events of today, but to our journey together with Archbishop Gregory as shepherd of this Holy Church of Washington. Welcome. Your Eminence, Cardinal Well, Your Excellency Archbishop Wilton Gregory, Your Excellency's Auxiliary Bishops Mario Donsonville, Roy Campbell, Michael Fisher, Your Eminences, my brother Archbishops and Bishops, dear priests, deacons, consecrated religious and lay faithful of the Church in Washington, dear friends, we gather during this Easter season and in this basilica, dedicated to the Mother of God, to celebrate an occasion of joy, to welcome and to install Archbishop Wilton Gregory at the seventh Archbishop of Washington, whom the Holy Father has appointed to lead and shepherd this local church and to be the presence of Christ, the Good Shepherd, in this nation's capital, Archbishop Gregory. As you begin your mission of bringing the joy of the gospel and the hope offered by Jesus Christ to the clergy, religious, and people of this archdiocese, I urge you to take confidence in the prayers of the people of God for you, as well as the grace of Christ and the intercession of the Mother of God. I know that when I arrived in Washington, Three years ago, Cardinal Wuerl, who is present with us today, as well as the clergy and all the people, gave me a very warm welcome, which brought me both encouragement and strength. As I came to know the local church in Washington, I discovered the church marked by a confluence of people from every race and nation, teeming with vocations to the priesthood and consecrated life, a strong laity, including the lay ecclesial movements, a healthy intellectual life, and a deep Catholic culture. The Holy Father has already expressed his gratitude to Cardinal Wuerl, and we take this opportunity to thank him for shepherding this church for more than a decade and to express our gratitude to him and to all those who have helped this precious patrimony of faith to flourish. This treasury of faith is now handed on to you. Of course, St. Lawrence knew that the true wealth of the Church is in the people of God and in their faith in Jesus Christ. It is these people that you are called to serve it is these people that thirst and hungers for Christ, and you are the shepherd that the Holy Father has called to satiate their thirst and hunger, especially for the love as you accompany them on their journey of faith. Your valuable experience as a bishop over the last 35 years, gained in the Archdiocese of Chicago, Diocese of Belleville, and more recently, in the Archdiocese of Atlanta has prepared you for this task, for this mission, but it is a mission. As you know, it is not merely the administration of a diocese, but it is the mission of evangelization in a church that goes forth. I did a quick Google search of quotations from you, and the first one that came came up red, I quote, many priests say that retirement is more identified with freedom from meetings 
budgets, personal conflicts, and dealing with the Chancery. Even I, as a you, I continue your, uh, the quotation. Even as I struggle not to take the last point too personally, I was reminded that I have heard the same sentiment from many of my bishop friends as well. I can see from the number of bishops nodding their heads, I cannot, I cannot. <laughs> they still agree. I saw them on the back, you know. <laughs> While I have every confidence, you will find your chancery both cooperative and competent. I would encourage you to trust your instincts and to get out of the chancery, and everybody else will check that. As you said in your press conference, to encounter the people, your priest and the archdiocese to build a culture of encounter and reinvigorate the faith by being a shepherd close to his flock, communicating the tender mercy of the heart of Jesus, who is the face of the Father's mercy. May Christ, the Good Shepherd, be your strength as you begin this new mission in the service of the Church in the nation's capital. And now it is my pleasure to read for you the apostolic letter of appointment, which, as you know, is written in Latin, and we have now a translation in English that it is signed by the Holy Father, Pope Francis. It will be shown to you later. Francis, Bishop, servant of the servants of God. To our venerable brother, Wilton Daniel Gregory, until now Archbishop of Atlanta, appointed Metropolitan Ordinary of Washington, greetings and apostolic blessing. Without being too worried about the activities of life, let us strive with all our hearts to comfort ourselves more deeply to our Redeemer, who left us an example, mindful that victory will not be denied to those who share in the suffering of the cross, nor will they be without the help of the prayer of Christ. Sustained by this hope for the good of our brothers as a standard of pastoral activity for governing the Church Universal, it is with fatherly love that we turn our attention to the spiritual needs of the ecclesial community of Washington, which currently vacant owing to the resignation of its former ordinary, our venerable brother, Donald William Howell, awaits its new shepherd and director of diocesan life. Consequently, we look to you, venerable brother, who have achieved so much in the exercise of your pastoral responsibilities in the Archdiocese of Atlanta and are endowed with the spiritual as well as human qualities, which, in our judgment, render you suitable for carrying out this office. Therefore, upon consultation with the Congregation for Bishops, by the fullness of our apostolic authority, we release you from the bond of the above-mentioned local church, and we appoint you Metropolitan Archbishop of Washington, granting to you the due rights and imposing the relative obligations which are connected with this mandate. It is our wish that you inform the clergy and the people of your ecclesial community about this our decree and we exhort them to welcome you as a father to be loved, a teacher to be heeded, and guardian of souls to be supported. Finally, venerable brother, as we entrust these rather important duties to you, we implore Almighty God to grace you before his people with the virtues of apostolic service, so that, together with the inter intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, you may carry this flock in the same loving manner than a man carries his child. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, on the fourth day of the month of April, in the year of the Lord 2019, 
the seventh of our pontificate, and it is signed Francis. Most Reverend Archbishop, you have heard the letter of His Holiness Pope Francis. You are called by the Holy Spirit to serve Almighty God and the people of the Archdiocese of Washington in faith and in love as their shepherd. Are you willing to accept this metro metropolitan see in the tradition of the apostolic faith of our church? With faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and with the love of God in my heart, I do accept the pastoral care of the people of God in the Archdiocese of Washington. I resolve to serve faithfully the spiritual needs of this local church. Thanks, Thanks be
Oremos, Dios nuestro, porque, que por la resurrección de tu Hijo nos rescata, rescatas para la vida eterna, concede a tu pueblo pre, preservar en la fe y la esperanza, para que no duda, dudemos que se han de cumplir las promesas que tú hiciste y nos has dado a conocer por nuestro Señor Jesucristo tu Hijo, que vive y reina contigo en la unidad de los Espíritu Santo y es Dios por los siglos de los siglos. Amén. Lectura del Libro de los Hechos de los Apóstoles En aquellos días, llegado Pablo a Jerusalén, trataba de juntarse con los discípulos, pero todos le tenían miedo, porque no se fiaban que fuera realmente discípulo. Entonces, Bernabé se lo presentó a los apóstoles, Saulo les contó cómo había visto al Señor en el camino, lo que le había dicho y cómo en Damasco había, había predicado públicamente el nombre de Jesús. Saulo se quedó con ellos y se movía libremente en Jerusalén, predicando públicamente el nombre del Señor. Hablaba y discutía también con los judíos de lengua griega que se propusieron suprimirlo. Al enterarse los hermanos, lo bajaron a Cesarea y lo enviaron a Tarso. La iglesia gozaba de paz en toda Judea, Galilea y Samaria. Se iba construyendo y progresaba en la fidelidad al Señor y se multiplicaba animada por el Espíritu Santo. Palabra de Dios.
A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Beloved, I exhort the presbyters among you as a fellow presbyter and witness to the sufferings of Christ and one who has a share in the glory to be revealed. Tend the flock of God in your midst, overseeing it not by constraint, but willingly, as God would have it, not for shameful profit, but eagerly. Do not lord it over those assigned to you, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd is revealed, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. The word of the Lord. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. On that day, as evening drew on, Jesus said to his disciples, let us cross to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took Jesus with them in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with him. A violent squall came up and waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already filling up. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Quiet, be still. The wind ceased, and there was great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you terrified? 
Do you not yet have faith? They were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this whom even the wind and the sea obey? The Gospel of the Lord. I come to this almost indescribably humbling moment in my life and in my ministry filled with deep gratitude, immeasurable joy, and unwavering confidence that the risen Lord who has guided me in my every voyage will remain beside me as I begin my service to the people of God in the Archdiocese of Washington as a fellow believer, a friend, and a pastor. In December 1983, in a side chapel of Holy Name Cathedral in Chicago, I made a solemn promise to live in union with and in obedience to the one who occupies the chair of Peter. I happily, readily, resolutely renew that promise today as I accept the appointment of Pope Francis to the extraordinary See of Washington. Over the years, I have come to know personally and to admire deeply the three men who have taken Peter's place within the church during my lifetime. These sentiments of affection and loyalty are born of firsthand experience, fostered by the warmth and wisdom of these three pontiffs, each distinct yet bound together by faith and a genuine love for Christ's church, each bearing unique gifts that have enriched us as a universal Catholic family. Pope Francis has now summoned the church, and by that I mean all the baptized, to leave our comfortable confines and to encounter and welcome the poor, the marginalized, and the neglected, and to place them at the very heart of Christ's church. Beginning today, that is my task here in the Archdiocese of Washington. I thank the Holy Father for that righteous challenge, more an opportunity, and I pledge my loyalty, respect, and fraternal affection to him once again. I proudly stand shoulder to shoulder with him as he governs and guides Jesus' church as a man of uncompromising faith and intractable joy. Pope Francis usually concludes his messages with the fervent request that we pray for him. I assure him of my prayers each day, and I ask all of you to keep this remarkable shepherd in your prayers as well. The Holy Father's representative in the United States, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, without diminishing his solemn ambassadorial responsibilities, has also become a friend to our nation 
and a brother to the bishops of the United States. I am grateful to him as well for his guidance, his humanity, and his pervasive, infectious spirit of hope. Not only do he and I share our church's common mission of proclaiming the gospel of joy, we now also share this wonderful city, and we treasure both more than simple words can express. Cardinal World has been and remains a cherished friend and Episcopal colleague now for many years. He is, above all, a true Christian gentleman, and I thank him publicly and sincerely for his warm welcome, his gentle demeanor, his support, and his affirmation. I greet and thank the distinguished guests from the office of the President and all of the public and elected officials here present. I warmly welcome our ecumenical and interfaith colleagues and friends, whose attendance reminds us all of the vitally important and mutually enriching work of ecumenism and interfaith collaboration. The laity, religious, and clergy of the Archdiocese of Washington have provided me an affectionate and embarrassingly gracious welcome. I have already come to admire and respect them as a true family of faith, committed to their local church and to their neighbors, willing and even anxious to work together to bring the good news to the larger community and the world through word and deed. I look forward to deepening my closeness with and my love for them. We stand at a defining moment for this local faith community. Our hearts are filled with hope and eagerness. The storied history of this great archdiocese is a gift to the church in the United States of America. Our recent sorrow and shame do not define us. Rather, they serve to chasten and strengthen us to face tomorrow with spirits undeterred. Together, we implore the Holy Spirit to fortify us with the grace, perseverance, and determination that only Christ himself is able to provide as a gift of his presence, peace, and promise. As we heard proclaimed in today's gospel, Jesus spent considerable time around fishermen, and with good reason. In them he found people who knew the value and the satisfaction of hard work and long days, and they didn't shy away from either. He wisely chose his first disciples from among those who made their living on the sea selecting individuals adept at handling their boats and nets, certainly, but also at using their wits and their wherewithal to secure their often elusive daily catch. He recognized their fierce tenacity to get the job done and eventually redirected their focus from fish to families. Jesus' first disciples were obviously accustomed to the vicissitudes of their marine way of life. Yet they were not so stalwart that they were not frightened when the sea, as it so often did, began to churn. They had both a healthy respect for and a genuine fear of the power of the wind and water that pounded them. When conditions were calm, they felt secure. When the squalls came and they no longer felt in control of their situation or their surroundings, they became afraid. 
life on the sea continues to serve as a worthy metaphor for us as people of faith. We have been tossed about by an unusually turbulent moment in our own faith journeys recently and for far too many for far too long waves of unsettling revelations have caused even the hardiest among us to grow fearful and perhaps even at times to want to panic we too like those frightened disciples tossed about by the wind and the waves have cried out teacher do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus' questions to them are also meant for us. Why are you terrified? Do you not yet have faith? The disciples must have felt instantly embarrassed and even ashamed by the Lord's scolding that day. In their anxiety, they had discounted that Jesus, the Christ, was literally in the boat with them. The very one who had fed the multitudes with so little, restored sight to the blind, raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. That very one was in the boat with them. And with a phrase and in a breath, he calmed the wind and the sea and restored their composure. While I know in my heart, and I believe that you know in your hearts as well, that Jesus is in the boat with us during tempestuous times, I confess that I don't possess the words to put every soul at ease, to assuage every fear, to lessen every pain. But I do remind you, even as I sometimes have to remind myself, that he is here. He is here when the seas are calm, and he is here even during moments of uncertainty, anger, fear, and shame. He invites us to place our trust in him not in trite and easy answers or programs, but in Him and in Him alone. He will calm and steady His church, not through any single minister. Rather, He wants nothing more than for us to trust Him, to bring us back safely to shore, and even be bolstered by the trials that we have endured and he always does. If indeed we are to trust more in him and less in ourselves, we must admit our own failures. We clerics and hierarchs have irrefutably been the source of this current tempest. The entire church must recall that we all belong to Christ first and foremost. Our dignity is not to be found in numbers, influence, or possessions, but in him who remains with us even during the most turbulent moments of life. I whole, wholly take to heart St. Peter's admonition to the early presbyters, not to lord it over those entrusted to them, but to be an example for their people. The example that I wish to set forth for you is that of a man filled with the faith, hope, and joy of knowing Jesus Christ is in the boat. I want to be a welcoming shepherd who laughs with you whenever we can, who cries with you whenever we must, and who honestly confesses his faults and failings before you when I commit them, not when they are revealed.
I began this my first homily as the Archbishop of Washington by acknowledging my gratitude and my hope. I discovered those virtues in the lives of countless people who are so dear to me. I give praise to God for my parents, Ethel and Wilton, who cooperated with God in giving me the breath of life. May they now enjoy the fullness of life. I pause in sheer admiration and deep appreciation for my beloved grandmother, Etta May, a woman who may have lacked any academic degrees, but whose heart was filled with love, wisdom, and common sense, which she generously shared with my two sisters, Elaine and Claudia, and me. A brother could not have better, more loving sisters than do I. The long list of my friends, neighbors, teachers, and mentors is too lengthy to even attempt to share. Many of them were priests and bishops who shaped me and witnessed before me what truly, what true priestly ministry could and should be. The people of Chicago still claim me as one of their own. And I gladly, proudly accept that designation. My faith family in the Diocese of Belleville helped me to discover that, tended gently with loving care, the seeds of the church, like the seeds of the earth, grow hearty and strong in a variety of settings, urban, rural, and small town. The people of Southern Illinois helped form me in every facet of my Episcopal ministry. Indeed, it is quite simply where I learned to be a diocesan bishop, and they remain a part of every good thing that I do. And then, and then there is the Church of Atlanta the blessed community where I discovered Southern roots, traditions, and love that have assisted in preparing me for this moment. I assure them all that there will never be a day when Georgia isn't on my mind. <laughs> Finally, to my brother bishops, so many of whom honor this local church by their presence and who strengthen me by their prayers and fraternity. I offer them this closing word of gratitude and respect. For nearly 36 years, I have been a member of this episcopate, during which, like you, I have witnessed great joy and profound sorrow. I thank you, my dear brothers, for your kindness and your support, which spurs me on to love and lead this new faith family with enduring devotion. I did not begin my homily with those expressions of gratitude and love for fear that I might not be able to conclude without, well, losing it. Today, my old and new friends, my family, my brothers, we began a journey together on undeniably choppy seas. We are informed by Christ's rep reprimand of his disciples that their fear and uncertainty were not the products of the tumult around them, but of an inexplicable lack of faith in the one who was literally right beside them. When Jesus Christ, with a phrase, in a breath, finally leads us out of this storm of our own making, may he not feel compelled to admonish us for exhibiting a collective lack of confidence in him, 
but rather to be proud of the undaunted, uncompromising faith that we never lost. For the gospel makes it clear, and I believe, and you believe, that the one whom even wind and sea obey has never left our side. Be assured of my prayers for you, even as I ask for yours for me. May God bless our Archdiocese of Washington. Amen. My brothers and sisters, let us offer our prayers to God, confident that he will hear our prayers and answer them in faithfulness and in love. For the church, one and holy because of the spirit who pervades her, that she may remain steadfast in faith and draw from Christ her head and Lord the strength to grow more perfect in unity and love. Let us pray to the Lord. Pour notre saint père, le pape François, que le Seigneur qui l'a choisi comme pasteur de l'Église universelle lui donne santé et force pour exercer pleinement son ministère de réconciliation et de miséricorde. Let us pray to the Lord. Chúng ta hãy cầu cho Đức Tổng Giám mục Wilson D. Gregory, đấng đã được ủy thác coi sót Tổng Giáo phận Washington, Xin Chúa gìn giữ và giúp Ngài luôn luôn là một mục tử trung thành, khôn ngoan và thánh thiện. Xin cho cuộc đời mục tử của người tại Tổng Giáo Phận Washington luôn thấm nhuần với ý thức chúng ta thuộc về Chúa. Let us please pray to the Lord. Para sa lahat ng mga leaders civil, upang maitaguyod nila ang bigay ng Diyos na karangalan at karapatan ng bawat tao at kabanalan ng buhay, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord. Makandini Kaha chota gugon son ke chuku makwa mati hunanya dio mimi nke kristi nwere nebe hano let us pray to the lord ting wai na se san san bao so ji mo de yan ke to kou ju ji yu bang yan let us pray to the Lord.
We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Por nuestros hermanos y hermanas difuntos, quienes acomodamos con nuestras oraciones a nuestro misericordioso Redentor para que puedan ver a Dios cara a cara. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept the invocation of your church and pour out your spirit upon us that we may witness with joy and zeal to make the good news of the gospel. We ask this through Christ our Lord.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the praise and glory of his name, our heart and of all his holy church. Receive, O Lord, we pray, these offerings of your exultant church. And as you have given her cause for such great gladness, grant also that the gifts we bring may bear fruit in perpetual happiness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just to give you thanks and raise to you a hymn of glory and praise. O Lord, Father of infinite goodness, for by the word of your Son's gospel, you have brought together one church from every people, tongue, and nation, and having filled her with life, by the power of your spirit, you never cease through her to gather the whole race into one, manifesting the covenant of your love. She dispenses without ceasing the blessed hope of your kingdom and shines bright as the sign of your faithfulness which in Christ Jesus our Lord you promised would last for eternity. And so with all the powers of heaven, we worship you constantly on earth, while with all the church as one voice we acclaim. You are indeed holy and to be glorified, O God, who love the human race and who always walk with us on the journey of life. Blessed indeed is your Son present in our midst when we are gathered by his love and when, as once for the disciples, so now for us, he opens the scriptures and breaks the bread. Therefore, Father, most merciful, we ask that you send forth your Holy Spirit to sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, on the night of the Last Supper, he took bread and said the blessing broke the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, gave you thanks, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many 
for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, Holy Father, as we celebrate the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Savior, whom you led through his passion and death on the cross to the glory of the resurrection, and whom you have seated at your right hand, we proclaim the work of your love until he comes again, and we offer you the bread of life and the chalice of blessing. Look with favor on the oblation of your church, in which we show forth the paschal sacrifice of Christ that has been handed on to us. And grant that by the power of the spirit of your love, we may be counted now and until the day of eternity among the members of your son in whose body and blood we have communion. Lord, renew your church, which is in Washington by the light of the gospel. Strengthen the bond of unity between the faithful and the pastors of your people. Together with Francis, our Pope, my brother Wilton, the bishop of this church, and the whole order of bishops, that in a world torn by strife, your people may shine forth as a prophetic sign of unity and concord. Remember our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the peace of your Christ, and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. Admit them to rejoice in the light of your face, and in the resurrection give them the fullness of life. Grant also to us, when our earthly pilgrimage is done, that we may come to an eternal dwelling place and live with you forever, there in communion with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, with the apostles and martyrs and all the saints, we shall praise and exalt you through Jesus Christ, your Son. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
el Señor, dichoso el que se acoge a Él. Gustad y ved que bueno es el Señor, dichoso el que se acoge a Señor en todo momento, su alabanza está siempre en mi boca, mi alma se gloria en el Señor, que los humildes lo escuchen y se alegren. Salcemos juntos su nombre. Yo consulté al Señor y me respondió. Me libró de todas mis ansias. Señor, todos sus devotos, que nada les falte a quienes lo respetan. Los ricos se arruinan y pasan pero los que gustan al Señor no les falta. Señor, dichoso el que 
Oremos. Dirige, Señor, tu mirada compasiva sobre tu pueblo, al que tú has dignado renovar con estos misterios de vida eterna, y concédele llegar un día de la a la gloria incorruptible de la resurrección. Por Jesucristo nuestro Señor. Amén. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.